bring this morning three truths about God himself this morning. If you need a Bible, you can find one in the pew in front of you. I welcome you to use it. If you don't have one, you can take it with you this morning and take it home with you. And in that Bible, you'll find our portion of Scripture on page 1303 or 1303. We'll be there in just a moment. What we need this morning, every one of us needs not just some type of self-help. We don't need some type of shot in the arm. What we need is life-changing truth. It does not matter what I think. It does not matter what you think. And it does not matter what everyone else thinks. But it does matter what God thinks. This morning we're going to take our time and look at Acts chapter 12. I'm going to do something this morning that I don't always do. And we will at one point read the entire chapter of Acts chapter 12. It's about 25 verses there. It's a tremendous story. We're going to find out what happens in the story. There's, There's imprisonment. There is a little bit of death in there. There's loud victory cries, and then God wraps it all up. But what happens in Acts chapter 12 is that God will show three attributes, three characteristics about himself to you and to I. If we're not careful, we'll begin to assume who God is and how God works. And we will get off in a wrong path when we put our own view on the God rather than look at the Bible to see what is the right view of God. It would be like saying, listen kids, in math class, just come up with your own answers and I'll mark it okay. And a good teacher wouldn't do that and shouldn't do that. And neither should we in life begin to approach life without looking at the word of God, the Bible, and asking God, what are you like? What is your character? Without the Bible, we can construct any idea about God that we desire. And that is what many religions will do. They will just construct ideas about God. We want to go back to the Bible and say, all right, what does the Word of God say about God, and how do we follow that? So this morning, as we open our Bibles, we're going to look at Acts chapter 12. We'll read the entire passage, but I want to point out three attributes, three characteristics. And then for all you teachers in here, I'm going to ask you three hard questions. It's not a quiz. They're thought-provoking questions. Three questions that all of us ought to think about because of the truth from God's Word. You see, God's Word is not there merely to inform us, but God's Word is there to transform us. Not just the idea that I get it inside of me, but the fact is that I have it here so it does something inside of me. This is what the Word of God wants to do and what God wants to do this morning at First Baptist Church. So let's go, Lord, in prayer this morning, ask for his blessing and help, and then we'll look at right Acts chapter 12, and we'll read the entire chapter this morning. Lord, I thank you for the time that we have this morning. Lord, thank you for all those who came, the teachers, the families, Lord, but every single person who's here this morning, whether they're in this building or another building, those who join us online as well. And Lord, I pray that today, in the next few moments, as we look at your word, that your word would touch us and change us this morning. Lord, I pray that your word would make sense to us that your truth would correct us if we have a wrong thought about you. And Lord, I pray that everything that's done here would please you. And Lord, if there are those here this morning who have never put their faith in you, who have never trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation, Lord, I pray that today that the gospel would be plain. And Lord, that today they would not leave without trusting in you. Lord, we sure love you. We thank you for this time. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have those Bibles open, Acts chapter 12, if you need one in the pew, grab that. It'll also be on the screen. We'll begin in verse number one. We pick up in the story. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, that is Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night... Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, 
and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind down thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but he thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And Peter knocked at the door of the gate, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with a hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and unto the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death, and he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god and not of a man. And immediately... The angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. My friends, this morning in Acts chapter 12, it's just a story. From beginning to end, we have a few characters. We have this man by the name of King Herod. Herod. Now, history tells us that this was Herod Agrippa I. Later on, if you continue in the book of Acts, you'll come across Agrippa II, but this is Agrippa I. We can find him in history. We can find him in, in detail about his reign there. But the Bible gives us a, a strange account in Acts chapter 12. The Bible begins and tells us that Herod as a ruler, decided to persecute the Christians, those new believers, those who, who called on Jesus Christ. Not because they were causing a ruckus, just because he saw that it made the Jewish people happy. That's what the Bible says in the first few verses. You can look at it later on. And so here it goes on a mission, and he just decides to persecute those who have called on Jesus Christ. Verse number two tells us, that the persecution was so great that he ended up taking the life of James, the brother of John. Now, the Bible tells us in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there were two boys. They were called the sons of thunder. One was John and one was James. This is that James. And James is now, story tells us, he's dead. James has lost his life, not because of some crime he has committed, not because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but because he was persecuted for following Jesus Christ. As we begin this morning, I want to give us a truth, and this truth is not the, the most encouraging truth, but it is encouraging. You see, you can go to some churches, 
and they will tell you that life will always be roses. But you and I both know that's not true. Why do we get flat tires if life is roses? Why does my car break down? Why does tr transmission fail? Why do I get the bad report from the doctor? We know that sometimes trouble comes in life, do we not? We don't have time, but we could take the microphone around and we could talk about trouble and it'd be a great competition. Who has the worst trouble? It's, it's better than fishing stories. Some will tell you a bigger trouble and a worse trouble. It happens at church sometimes. You'll be hurt, your leg will be hurt, and you'll be there in church and someone else will tell you how bad they're hurt. Well, here's the first truth about God I want you to know this morning. Truth number one is this, that God does not always remove his children from trouble. So we learn from Acts chapter 12. God does not always remove his children from trouble. Now I know that some of you are like, well, I, don't, I don't like that very much, Pastor. I, I like the idea that he always removes his children from trouble. I like the idea that the cancer is always taken care of. I like the idea that my tires never go flat. That there's never a bill that I can't pay. That there's never a disagreement in my marriage. That there's never a problem at work or at the school or with a student or parent. I, I want the truth that God always removes the trouble. But my friends, the Bible doesn't teach us that. The Bible teaches us that God does not always remove his children from trouble. Sometimes, sometimes persecution will come. Sometimes bad things happen, even to good people. And the natural question is, well, why would God do that? Why would God allow James, this disciple, to die? Why would God do that? As if, as if everything that God does must make sense to me or to you. And then only if I can make sense of it and agree with it, then I can endorse God. Parents, bosses, teachers, you know that you make decisions that all those around you don't understand. When our kids were young, the decisions were easy. Don't touch the outlet. And I had a couple kids who couldn't figure that out. Right? As if that would make sense to them. Well, it will make sense if you can't come in contact with it. Like, we can, see, we, can, we can make this a real life practical lesson for you, boy. But we treat God the same way. As if what God does has to make sense to me, and then I can judge if it's fair or not. You see, God never promises to be fair, but he does promise to be good. Here's the question I want you to consider this morning. If God doesn't remove his children from trouble, are you content with what God does? Are you content with what God does? It's not rhetorical as an answer to this question. And I'll tell you the answer. All of us at times say no. All of us at times have said, no, God, I'm not content with what you've done. I wanted it to be different. I wanted the situation to end up differently. I wanted the diagnosis to be different. We're not always content. We're not always satisfied. We're not always comfortable. Lord, I don't want to stay in the trouble. I want you to get me out of the trouble. The truth is that God does not always remove the trouble, but the question is, are you content with what God does? And the answer is faith. You see, faith trusts God even when life seems unfair. Faith trusts God even when life seems to be unfair. I remember a sermon once where a man said this, it's okay to ask God why as long as you accept God's answer. And then he took the portion of Scripture that I had not considered until he said that at that moment, where Jesus Christ on the cross said this, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus Christ on the cross asked God why. But you know what God's answer was from the cross? Silence. 
Some things we won't find out until we get to heaven. Faith trusts God even when life seems unfair. And it's okay to ask God why as long as you accept God's answer. Just because James wasn't free doesn't mean the church wasn't praying. Just because James wasn't free doesn't mean God isn't good. History tells us this story. A church historian, Clement of Alexandria, tells us that there was a soldier who was guarding James during this time. Now, I could not verify the story, but Clement is a historian for the church history. And he said that one of the soldiers with James, when James, this man, was executed, so was moved by his faith that he chose to give his life for Jesus Christ as well. You see, God's always doing something bigger than you and I can see. God's always doing something that is beyond you and I. God doesn't want us just to look at today, but he wants us to look at him. And that's why James, in the book of James, the other man mentioned here later on here says this, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into trials and temptations, diverse temptations. Knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. You see, when life seems tough, God does not always remove his children from trouble, but my faith can trust God even when life seems unfair. There's another truth in this passage I want you to notice this morning. Because a few verses later we find out, after James dies, that Peter's now in jail. And Herod is about to do the same thing to Peter. And the church is praying. And they're praying. And they're praying. And during this time, an angel comes, and he wakes up Peter, and he hits him on the side and says, Peter, get up. And Peter thinks it's a vision. And so Peter gets up, and the angel, the Bible says, what we read, says to Peter, walk out of here, and the chains fall off, and the first gate opens, and the second gate opens, and the iron gate opens, and they're outside, and the, Peter leaves, or the angel leaves, and Peter is standing there. And the Bible says that Peter's considering what's going on. Now, if you were in jail... And now you're out of jail. How long does that considering take? All right, I think I can process pretty quickly. I'm not the smartest guy, but I can work through that real fast. So you know, I look at this, and I just, my mind goes this place. I'm like, Peter's like looking around. Oh, look at that. I'm outside now. It's interesting. What should I do now? Get a burger? I don't know. No, Peter goes to the house of Mary, another disciple named John Mark. It's his mother's house. And they're all praying for Peter's release. And he goes and he knocks on the gate. And a young girl comes named Rhoda. And he's like, it's Peter. And she's like, who is it? It's Peter. No, you're in jail. It's Peter. This is my voice. We're praying for you to get out of jail. So it can't be Peter. And finally she realizes, she didn't open it. She knows it's Peter's voice. The Bible says that. She recognizes his voice. So she's like, oh, this is great. Peter's outside the gate. She doesn't open the gate. That's a whole other sermon whole nother sermon, all right? Missing the obvious. That's that sermon, right? We've all missed the obvious. We, all, all of us, all of us, all right? She runs inside, and she's like, hey, guess what? You guys are praying for Peter, but he's outside the gate. They're like, no, he's not. We're praying for him. We're praying for him. He's not outside. Yeah, he's outside. You guys can stop praying. And they're like, no. And this is what they said. They, they, they don't believe her. I think it's verse 15. They say, thou art mad. You're crazy, Rhoda. They are, they are insulting her. Here they are praying for Peter to be released. She goes, he's released. And they're like, you are crazy, girl. Like, get out of here and let us go back to praying so Peter can be released and not die tomorrow. Finally, they realize that she's not crazy. They go outside and Peter's actually outside. You're like, okay, what's going on here, pastor? Here's the second truth. Because the first truth is sometimes God keeps his children in trouble. Number two, God can change seemingly, humanly seemingly impossible situations. God can change these things. I know that sometimes God leaves us in those spots, but know this, that God can't change them. And that's, he goes right from James dying to Peter being knocked out of prison. That's awesome. That's incredible. We see the hand of God no one thought it would happen this way. No one apparently thought it would happen right then. But God can change seemingly 
impossible circumstances. Here's the question to ask yourself this morning. How strong is my faith? How strong is my faith? Because sometimes our faith is just a little too small. I wonder what they were praying for. I wonder if they were praying, Lord, help, help Herod to see the light of day. Help, help Peter not. They weren't praying, Lord, send an angel right now, right to the prison, and have the chains fall off. They weren't praying that way. Because if they had, they would have been looking for the answer. But they're like, "Uh uh-uh, he's not out there. You know, it'll be done tomorrow. Sometimes our faith is a little bit too small. I have some stories here, and for a second time I can't read them all. But I had them look up some miracles that happened on 9-11. A terrible day in American history. But there were some miracles that Christians said, this is what God did for us that day. A CEO was supposed to be in the towers that day. He was late because his son started kindergarten. Coincidence or God? Another man's alive to this day. Why? Because it was his turn to bring in donuts. Coincidence or God? One woman is alive today because her alarm clock failed to go off in time. Another individual is late because they were stuck on the New Jersey turnpike because of an auto accident. One of them missed their bus. One of them spilled food on their clothes and had to take time to change. One car wouldn't start. One, oh, and this just got me right here. One had a child that dawdled and didn't get ready as soon as they should have. I can identify with that one right there. And I bet that person that morning when they're all trying to drive in, like, oh my goodness, I can't believe my child would make me late for work this morning. I have so much to do. And yet we can see the hand of God. God can change seemingly impossible circumstances. And sometimes our faith is just too small. Just way too small. One man put on a new pair of shoes that morning and left for work. Before he got there, before he got to work, he got a blister on his foot. And he stopped at a drugstore to buy a Band-Aid. And then we have those believers who were praying for Peter to be released. And surprised when he was. I've used this story before, but I love this story. It's a story about a small town. They had been a non-alcohol, a dry town. But then a local businessman decided to build a bar in the town. So a group of Christians at the church began to pray. And they asked that God would intervene for this tavern, for this bar. Just so happened that shortly thereafter, a lightning storm came, struck the bar, it burned down to the ground. The owner of the bar sued the church. Claiming that the prayers of the congregation were responsible for the loss of his building. And the church hired a lawyer to defend them in court, claiming that it wasn't the fault of their prayers that the bar burned down. The judge made this statement. No matter how this case comes out, one thing is clear. The tavern owner believes in prayer, and this group of Christians does not. My friends, sometimes... Our faith is just a little bit too small. Sometimes in life, in a seemingly impossible situation, God may keep us here, but God can change it just like that. It's time that we exercise some faith and pray and say, God, you can do this. Now, I'm content if you don't. I'll trust you because I believe you to be good, but God, you can change this right now. You can knock off the chains from Peter right now. You can change this diagnosis right now. Our faith sometimes is just a little bit too small. We continue on, there's one more truth in this story. It's pretty cool that Peter gets released. Everyone's happy. They're all rejoicing. And it seems as if Herod, he gets a little bit bamfoozled. He can't figure out what happened to Peter, and he, he's mad at everyone how Peter got out, not realizing it was God. The Bible tells us, though, an interesting thing that happens is that Herod ends up moving on to another place. And one day, Herod gets up, and he makes a speech. We don't know what Herod said that day, but apparently it was a very moving speech. 
a powerful speech, something that just captivated the audience, something that gripped them to the depths of their soul. So moving was it that the people there gave up a shout. They began to cheer for Herod. And they said, that is the voice of God and not of a man. The Bible says apparently that Herod took notice of this cheer. And Herod embraced the cheer. We know that because the Bible says in the next verse that immediately an angel of the Lord smote Herod because he gave not God the glory. It wasn't from the people that Herod apparently began to revel in that sound of those cheers saying, hey, look at me. Wow, look, look at who I am. Boy, I, I must be a good speaker. I'm a, I'm a good king. Wow, I am amazing. And Herod sits up there high and mighty in that day on that throne for that oration, the people cheering, and God says... Not today, Herod. Here's a third truth we must remember. God always wins. God always wins. If you look in your Bibles, please, back there at Acts chapter 12, in verse 23. In verse 23, the Bible says, And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten up of words and gave up the ghost. But look at verse 24. Following the demise of Herod, we have this. But, see that word but there in verse 24? In direct contrast to what happened with Herod, but. So on the demise of Herod, on the fall of Herod, in direct, in direct relationship to that was this. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Remember how we started the chapter? Herod said, I'm going to persecute the church. I'm going to show them I'm the boss. I'm going to show them I'm the big and mighty king. And in the course of just 24 verses, in just a little amount of time, we find Herod being high and mighty. And in direct contrast, because he gave not God the glory, we find that God says, I always win, Herod. And the word of God grew and multiplied. Have you ever cheered for a losing team? Yeah. Did somebody say the Lions? You know, there's going to be a new... You know, I was going to be done in a few moments. We're going to stay for a few moments, all right? I'm going to talk... <laughs> sure, you cheer for the Lions. I am a Lions fan. They win and they lose, sure. I've seen some crazy Lions fans, right? You go to games and they paint their, they paint their chest and they, you know, they're like, they're crazy. They're crazy. And then the Lions... Loose, right? And you're, people are devastated. Oh, man, they, what, what has happened? Oh, and I remember one time I was at a baseball game, and on the way home, we were cheering for the Tigers that day, and they lost that day as well. And the other team, some fans for their team was right there, and somebody engaged the other fans. Never a good thing, right? It became a shouting match because our team lost, their team won, and boy, and, and it can be a sad thing to cheer for a losing team, can it not? Whether it's your child, whether it's a, a pro event, which doesn't matter in life at all, right? It can be a sad thing to cheer for a losing team. But can you imagine living for the losing team? Because that's what Herod did. He didn't just cheer for the losing team. He made choices to live for the losing team. And so much so that he ended up in demise. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Temporary setbacks do not mean ultimate defeat. The question is this, are you on? Are you on the winning side? You see, what we put our faith in will have eternal ramifications. What we choose to believe will affect us not just today and not just tomorrow, but forever. And at the beginning of Acts 12, we have James being killed, Peter in prison. But by the end of Acts chapter 12, Peter's out of prison and Herod's off the scene. But God is not off the scene. And my friends, some point, God will turn everything around. It may be today and it may not be for a thousand years, but God always wins. And what we put our faith in will have eternal ramifications. To believe in Jesus is to believe that he is the son of God. Jesus Christ said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he said this, before Abraham was, I am. 
To put our faith in Jesus, to put our faith in God, is to believe in Jesus Christ, to believe that He is the Son of God, that He died on the cross for the sins of the world. No matter how bad our sins are, God's gift of Jesus Christ is greater. And they buried him. And he rose again the third day. A few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was Jesus Christ rising from the dead. The Bible tells us that when he rose from the dead, he conquered death. That by believing in Jesus Christ, we can have eternal life. He that hath the Son hath life. It's Jesus Christ. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Later on, we find out in Acts around Herod's son, the next Herod, Agrippa II, where Paul will be talking to him in the context of that conversation with a few different leading individuals, you'll find this phrase, almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. It's not enough just to know, but someone has to believe and take the step of faith in their life to turn from their own way and what will block them. For some people, it's the blocking of their own works. I think I'm good enough to go to heaven, but the Bible says there are none righteous, no, not one. For others, they rely on their baptism, but the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Only one way to heaven, his name is Jesus Christ. And God always wins. So let's make sure we put our faith in him. See, sometimes there'll be trouble in life. Sometimes the sun won't shine in life. Boy, I wish it wasn't that way. I wish I could tell you the sun will always shine in your life. But I can tell you this, God will always be good in your life. And with God, there is always goodness. And even on the worst day of your life, spent with God is the best day. Number two, God can remove seemingly impossible circumstances. How big is your faith? For some this morning, your faith needs to get a little bit bigger. You just say, God, I need to see you work today. I need to see you work in this situation right now, and don't be surprised when he does. Don't be surprised when he does. And for some this morning, it's time to accept the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ and to come onto God's winning side. 